Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Spinach ICOM NAT 2020 virtual conference. This is session one, channel one, on Thursday, June 11th, titled Managing and Mobilizing Collection Data with Specify Software and the Specify Collections Consortium. The symposium will be followed by a Specify Collections Consortium Q&A. My name is Noreen Spears, and with me is Teresa Miller. We are both on staff at the Specify Collections Consortium. We also have Jim Beach, Director of the Consortium with us today. Thank you for joining us and thank you to our six speakers in this session. Each order will present for 10 minutes followed by five minutes of questions at the end. I will sound a chime when there's one minute left in the presentation. We will also be taking questions during the presentations, and for that, we will use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. So please type your questions in the Q&A window. Teresa will be monitoring the questions and ask them of the presenter at the end of the talk. If we happen to run out of time and the speaker is unable to answer your question live, or if you think of a question after they're done talking, they will still be able to see the question. So please feel free to continue to type in your questions throughout the symposium. The chat function is also available during the session and we ask that you use chat for technical questions or for conversing with each other. Chat comes with a disclaimer, so please use it judiciously. Any nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat may result in the removal from the session or the chat function being disabled. Spinach has issued a code of conduct document for this and you can find that on their conference website. We also ask for your patience as we bear with all technical difficulties we might experience and for your viewing pleasure, this session will be recorded and available later. We hope that you enjoy the session. With that, I am very excited to introduce our first speaker, Willem Kutzer. His presentation is Extending the Use of Specified Software in South African Natural Science Collections. Please bear with me as I bring up his presentation. Okay, thank you, Noreen. I assume I can start? Yes, please. Thanks very much. Um, I'm quite aware that I may have extended the, I may be pushing the boundaries of uh, a 10 minute presentation with everything I'd like to cover, but I don't want to start before I thank the Specify team in Lawrence for what has really become a wonderful partnership and collaboration more than a system of support and assistance for all the wonderful um, support we've received from you for more than 15 years. I've only been involved for 15 years, but I know that the history goes back longer than that. So thank you very much. Uh, so my first slide just gives you an idea of what I'd like to cover. If you can just move the slide. Thank you. So I would like to start by talking about the Specify 7 platform for natural science museums in South Africa. Um, then I'm going to talk about the management of genomic samples using Specify. And those two topics are very relevant to the context of natural history museums and natural science museums. And this being a spinach presentation, that is obviously appropriate. And then the other topics um, might, might not be as relevant to, to the context of natural history collections, but as I said, I, I would like to give some indication of how we are using Specify in a slightly extended manner. And um, I'd really like to hear from anyone else who 
might be doing something similar. Um, so I'll be talking about managing ecological data using specify and specifically collection relationships. And then um, I'll end off with a description of an annotated checklist, species checklist. Thank you, can we have the next slide? So I'll talk about the Specify 7 platform just to give you an idea of the organizational background to this. The institution for which I work, the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity, is an institute of our National Research Foundation, which is somewhat analogous to the National Science Foundation in the US. In other words, we receive a parliamentary grant that is administered through our Department of Science and Innovation in the national government but we ourselves are not a government department. And um, I say this because it's important to contextualize the Specify 7 platform, which is used by a number of different natural science museums in the country, eight in fact. And these museums all come from very different organizational backgrounds and they have different parent organizations ranging from local government, to uh, provincial or state government or a national government department. Um, and so they are not all well resourced. And um, the adoption of Specify 7 is perhaps somewhat easier when you have a dedicated systems administrator, such as in the context of SIAB or the place where I work. And so this is the reason why we have enable this um, enable the museums to use this platform in this way and uh, can we have the next slide please thank you so here you can see just a little schematic diagram that i made of how i envision the support system to work you would have a museum information coordinator in each museum and this person would be responsible for doing various things like cataloging data obviously performing query, making labels and reports, or indeed reporting a support issue to the information manager at SIAP, who happens to be me at this point in time. Um, I would then either consult the SIAP systems administrator, this is the important person I referred to that we are fortunate to have, who runs the Specify 7 platform. And, um, or I could refer the support request to the specified team in Lawrence. And likewise, he could also use that route to ask them for support about the application itself. Um, so I won't go into too much detail there, but just to say that, um, you know, we did give some thought to how this would all work and how support would be coordinated. Um, we've had some very good feedback. Um, in fact, we've had no bad feedback. Everybody seems to be very happily using Specify 7 at South African Natural History Museums. There are some museums that uh, have still not joined the platform and some museums that are still not using Specify. But um, as I say, so far, everything seems to be going very well indeed. Okay, I think I'll move on to the next slide then. And here I'm going to be talking about the use of specify for genomic samples. Um, is there really only three minutes left? Goodness me. Uh, okay, this is probably then the last thing I'll be talking about. Um, the specific design that we use here was, um, it started off with the need to represent individual organisms as well as the jars or lots from which these individual organisms came. So if we can go to the next slide, you'll see that we have several different collections. We have a fish voucher collection, an amphibian voucher collection, a mammal voucher collection, and an invertebrate voucher collection. And we also have corresponding, what I call observation collections, that is where there are no vouchers, but we have made observations of fish or amphibians or mammals or invertebrates. And each of these collections is then related to a central individual organism collection. And it is that individual organism collection that has a preparation type, which is either tissue, a preserved tissue sample, or a DNA extraction, or in other words, genomic sample. And if we're gonna to go to the next slide, 
here you can see how the form design works. So on the left, you've got the collection object representing the jar. And on the right is the collection object representing the individual organism from that jar. And there's a collection relationship between those two collection objects. And um, one of the reasons why we have this setup is so that you can have two different determinations. You can identify the, the, the jar of fish in our case um, using the morphology of, of the specimens and you can identify the individual using genetic techniques. Uh, there are other reasons why you might have two collections, or two collections set up like this with collection relationships. Um, and one of these is that you, in, in such a setup, you need to do a query in only one place to see all the tissue. Another reason is that your storage tree is, all, all, the, all the locations in your storage tree where tissue may be stored are visible on the same screen. Um, and there was a, all right, there's a fourth reason. Um, this might not be valid for much longer because I hear that there's talk of changing this, but at the moment you can only import um, samples into the, into using the specified workbench and have it create additional collection objects. And in this case, um, it would be fine if you have a two collection setup because what you're doing is you're creating collection objects in the individual organism collection for individuals and you're not affecting the number of collection objects in, in the other side, in, in the other collection, which is the, the jar collection object side. Um, and I think I'm out of time, unfortunately. So I might have to end there. Um, I don't There's no questions yet if you want to go another minute. Okay, uh, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. I'll just show you the what we call the tissue workbench spreadsheet, which is the Excel spreadsheet where we capture all our tissue information. And the point I want to make here, and this is additional reasons for having, um, for using the workbench specifically to capture genome examples. And that is that we found that before we started using this system, Catalogers were not capturing storage locations. Storage locations of the samples. Whereas here, we are forcing them to capture a, a freezer location for each sample. And moreover, we are, we are giving them a pre-populated series of freezer locations to ensure that the freezer locations that they use are unique. So they can't reuse uh, the same freezer location for a different sample, which is also what happened before we started using the system. Um, so I think I'll probably have to end now. Yeah, I know a lot of people have shown a lot of interest in maybe talking to you later or seeing a recording of this later. And they would love to hear more from you. Um, okay. Does anybody have any questions for him right now? I think people are way too excited to actually talk to you about this to formulate questions yet. Why don't we go ahead for a few more minutes then? Because we've got okay. time. Thank you. Um, does it require okay. programming skills? Does it require programming skills? Um, no, I wouldn't say programming skills, but a little bit of form customization and otherwise um, the correct use of configuration files for the workbench, without which I find it very difficult, in fact, not only difficult, but possibly also potentially risky. Um, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that your configuration files are encoded 100% correctly and do all the necessary testing to make sure that all the fields that you have in your spreadsheet are being imported into the right places. Um, and as long as you've got your form set up correctly, and you've got your configuration file set up correctly, there's really nothing that can go wrong. And but no, no programming. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> did you use the standard forms or did you contact KU to modify them? Oh yes, definitely we contacted KU. That, that was, um, sorry, that was a long time ago. I, I didn't even, think of that, but yes, it was KU that, that uh, gave us, definitely gave us the form code 
to do the initial setup. And, and once you've stated that <laughs> the, the, the form XML for long enough, it, it becomes ingrained, emblazoned on your mind, and uh, it's, it's quite simple to work with from then. It's, it's just that initial form setup that uh, you definitely need help with. And you guys have learned how to work on that on your own a little bit too. So yeah, as I said, okay. well, no, we, we'll always need your help. But uh, the more you work with it, the, you know, the more errors you make, um, the, the quicker you learn, I guess. So the collection object and prep are associated in a one-to-one -one relationship? No, you uh, don't. Uh, there, there are different ways of doing it, um, but I think you're asking me about uh, whether I import only one preparation for each collection object in the individual collection. Um, I haven't thought much about that. We, we usually only have one tissue sample for each individual in any case, but in the, ca in, in the case that there is more than one, uh, they would become additional preps in the same collection object, the same collection object representing the individual organism. And how are JAR and DNA collection objects linked? Um, well, through through the, the collection of the, the collection relationship table in Specify, so that allows you to make this link between the two collection objects from the two collections. You, yeah, to physically make the link, you need to look up the catalog number of the individual. Um, organism. So you need to have either have two instances of specify running simultaneously or you need to jot down the, the catalog number of the individual and then you need to go to the jar collection object in the other instance of specify and look up that individual catalog number. And uh, do you have web portal or other ways to represent online and how do you export to GBIF? We do have a web portal. Um, we're just in the process of uh, testing the, the new web portal released by Specify. So um, we, at the, at the moment, we don't have an active web portal. We have had one for a number of years, but we were quite excited to release the, to, to use the new Specify web portal. And then we publish data to GBIF using the integrated publishing toolkits. And that, that works quite well for us. I think that's the last question. Is that true, Teresa? Yep, that's the last question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Willem. I apologize that you that you didn't get to show us everything, but I, it looks like you're going to get some some contacts afterward. So thank you. Okay, our second speaker is Robin Drinkwater with the Royal Botanic. Garden Edinburgh, and she's presenting Shifting a Collection Data Paradigm, Data Migration Between BG Base and Specify. And again, please bear with me while I share my screen. Okay, so yeah, I can see the slides. Excellent, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so hi, um, we're not currently, um, we've not made it into Specify quite yet. We're still in the process of migrating and negotiating some of the um, changes in data structure um, between BG Base and Specify. If you next slide. Um, <laughs> so a uh, very quick overview. Uh, we'll be looking at the mi um, migration and planning that. Um, we've done for this and then uh, the two biggest areas where we've had to think about how our data is structured is how whether we represent specimens as collection objects or preparations and how we record locality and then there'll be a few conclusions as well. Uh, next slide. So there's been several 
drivers for why we're currently undertaking this migration. And one is that the processes uh, in the herbarium have changed. So we need software that can help us facilitate those changes in how we want to curate and digitize our collections. Um, but also as a, a Scottish public body, we need to comply with the best practice guidance. And so that's also one of the drivers for the move to the new system. So the herbarium itself consists of around 3 million specimens. Uh, we have about a million of those data based in BG base at present. And as to be expected, that data is specimen uh, level data, uh, loan histories, taxonomy and geography. There's a whole load of data that we are trying to work out how to take it from one system over to the other. Um, in terms of the team working on it, there's four of us from the herbarium who's forming a core team and we're doing this work alongside our um, other stuff. Um, although with the, the recent pandemic, a lot of us have been focused in our offices at home on the, the migration. Um, we've got one developer who's in-house, um, who's doing the scripting to take it uh, to move the data. Uh, we've got a short-term data cleaner, she's with us for about eight months, helping us to tidy up our data both before and after we've completed the migration. And then there's the rest of the herbarium team who we've been consulting throughout and having discussions with. Uh, next slide. Um, so to enable us to understand how the what our workflows are at present and how these may be impacted as we move to the new system, we undertook a, um, a large number of workflow interviews looking at what specific tasks are carried out, where there's issues um, in the current system, what could be improved, what data are key to being able to continue that workflow and how we represent that in Specify. And following those, we drew up um, like step by step what the person is doing in in bg base to make these complete workflows and we're able to use that to um assess the workflows once we get into specify and make sure that the forms are all relevant and useful for the new people um, as part of the planning we've also had a visit from noreen and Teresa back in september uh, so they could see the what the processes at the herbarium and it was a fantastic opportunity for us to have a chat with them and go through a lot of the sort of steps that are needed for the uh, migration next slide so there's two big changes for us in, or potential changes for us in how our data are modeled. And the first is whether we represent specimens as a collection object or a preparation. And we need to, to understand how these options would affect workflows and how we'd manage our specimens. Uh, next slide. Um, oh, my screenshots are there. Um, in BG base, um, what you should be seeing is some lovely screenshots from the system. Um, but the specimen is represented by a single specimen record in BG Base. So there's a one to one relationship. And then relationships between specimens from a single collecting event are um, sort of shown within each record. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, one option for us moving from BG Base to specify would be to maintain that one-to-one -one relationship where each specimen becomes its own collection object. And if we move to the next slide, we've there's been a lot of discussion about what the pros and cons of this would be. Um, it would make things like the mapping very simple. Loans would be uh, work quite easily at the collection object level as uh, there would just be a single preparation for each one. Likewise, determinations would uh, just be associated with a single specimen. But we would also need to uh, disadvantages would be things like we'd have to look at how we uh, group associated specimens, how we um, record, uh, there would be potential duplication of label information needing to be entered, and we could get out of sync with our determinations. One object, one specimen from a single event could be updated when the others aren't. Um, so the other option that we've been considering uh, is the next slide. Um, is using a one-to-many relationship where we have all of the preparations from a single collecting event stored as part of that collection object. So everything that's got the same collector, collector number and date would be visible at once. And if we go to the next slide, um, again, we have a lot of discussions of the pros and, oh, sorry, could you go back one? Um, uh, pros and cons of that. Um, and it's 
been an interesting sort of discussion um, as to how that changes how we manage our collections, because this is different to what we currently have. So new determinations would be able to be applied to all specimens. Um, we could record exactly which specimen that determination came from. We could look at how the history of our collection has developed. We have duplicates that come from three different herbaria, but we're all collected at the same time. So we could start to examine the history of our collections. Um, in terms of disadvantages at present, specimen loans have sort of worked um, at a, an object level, but we've been working with Specify on this um, to, to look at how that could be managed on a preparation level. Um, we've been having discussions about how different levels of information on duplicate specimens could also be recorded. So it's been quite an interesting and um, in sort of ongoing conversation within the organisation as to how this imp impacts our management of the specimens. Uh, next slide. So the other thing that we've been uh, looking at is how localities are recorded. Um, and it's qu again quite different between Fiji Base, where we currently are, and specified as how it's managed. And a lot of this pivots on a latitude and longitude being associated with the locality name, whereas in Fiji Base it's more verbatim. So next slide. Um, so, oh, is there one before? Yeah, that one, <laughs> thanks. Um, so in BG Base, all of the locality data and higher geography data are stored per specimen record. So it's all associated very closely with the specimen from which it was transcribed. Um, next slide. Um, and all locality names are verbatim. So you could have the same one written slightly differently on a label or with a space accidentally put in by the transcriber and they're all treated separately. So when we're doing georeferencing work and other work, it's not always easy to, you can't do them all as a batch very easily. You sometimes have to work through each one individually. Uh, next slide. So in the um, move to specify, there's two proposed ways that we're looking at doing this. The first one is that we move to uh, um, using the locality table with a much more curated gazetteer style of locality record, um, where latitudes and longitudes are associated with specific uh, locality names. Um, with a sort of interim step where we're having to migrate our data initially into the collection object as it is in BG Base, and then through sort of data cleaning steps, start pulling together these groups of localities that are matched, and then create the locality records and attach those to the relevant specimens. Uh, next slide. The other structure that we're looking at um, is partly down to a lot of our specimens are from plots or um, transects collected in that way, where often the locality name is identical, but uh, the latitude and longitude can be different as in the example here. And so one of the way we could look at managing it is that we store latitude and longitude as recorded on the specimen as part of the collecting event, and then create uh, localities with more generalized, say a centroid uh, latitude and longitude. So that if we have, um, specimens where there's no data in the collecting event, we could always use the, the more general latitude and longitude from the, um, from the locality table. <laughs> so this is something where there's been a lot of active discussion at RBG and we're still looking at how best to migrate this element of our data over to the new uh, database. And um, so next slide. So we hope and we think we've now found most of the main differences in the in the two data models and um, we're now looking at how we can best manage those. Um, it's been really interesting and challenging to work out how to manipulate our data to, that we have in BT Base to fit this new system and that includes wanting to bring over metadata, holding fields and information potentially relating to data cleaning. Uh, we need to consider how we manage data loss so there's the, the obvious choosing not to move something over, but there's also, we're trying to be aware if there's any change in the meaning brought about uh, by the change, by a structural change to the database, and if so, how we manage that. And then more generally, there are different, the differences between data structures and databases could potentially have wider implications for interoperability. Um, and we're involved in some 
big European projects looking at creating Europe-wide collection portals and it'd be interesting to see whether there's any impacts from these different structures in data management systems as to how they um, impact our abilities to move data forwards. Um, so thank you very much. We've enjoyed working with a specified consortium and look forward to continuing that and having discussions with both the specified team but we're also happy to discuss any of this and more with um, other members of the consortium. So any questions or comments would be gratefully received. Thank you. Okay, the first question is from Andy Bentley. He wants to know if you've considered using a post data entry process to link specimens together. Um, we have looked at containers a bit. Um, I've seen he's mentioned it in his comment, um, but it's, we've never quite got our heads around it, so it's something we need to explore more. We've also got a few different situations. So we've got specimens from the same collecting event in different preparations, but we also have specimens from different collecting events on the same sheet. So we've got herbarium specimens with 10 different collecting events represented there. Um, so we need to find a way to manage both of those. And so containers, we've looked at, um, we would want to look at for both of those. and. Um, yeah, it's, it's something we need to explore further uh, to see how we can manage that. Uh, can't remember what other question. Oh, Tracy, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Hester Stein wanted to know why you decided on specify and not ROMs. Um, so I personally wasn't involved in that, but there was um, an extensive scoping exercise where we assessed the different systems available and found that Specify was more suited to what we wanted. Um, I think that's one of the, um, my, as before Rob, may be able to provide more if you should, if they're interested. Okay, Julie Shapiro wanted to know, what will you do with cooperative databases with other institutions? where you used BG base, how will these interdependent databases be transformed when you get to specify? Uh, is this where we've got, um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by cooperative databases. <laughs> um, but uh, so at the moment we use BG base to manage two collections, our living and our herbarium collection, and they're both migrating out into new systems. So we're looking at putting in uh, functionality uh, as maybe a standalone thing that will allow those two systems to talk to each other. Uh, there's other databases within RBGE and we're hoping that with the move we can start to bring some of those into Specify so that they're managed more centrally rather than being lots of independent uh, systems managed separately across the organisation. Um, Yvette Harvey wanted to say it was a great talk and will your new database have links with Ease Living Collection database. And yes. <laughs> had issues with the nomenclature of cultivars. All right. So we we are planning um, to maintain links between the Living Collection and the Herbarium. It's really key to what we do. We try and keep the taxonomy and the nomenclature aligned between them. So this is where there's going to be some additional um, development that allows the two systems to talk to each other. Um, so we are planning to maintain that and we, we've got fields allocated within our specify uh, setup to record the accession numbers of the living collections. In terms of the cultivars, we've not hit too many problems yet. The, we're able to fit cultivar into the, the uh, hierarchical tree structure in specify uh, for nomenclature and we're able to fit cultivar in as part of that. So at the moment it seems like it should be okay, but we've not hit any issues yet. <laughs> And Jen Wilk wants to know what version of Specify are you migrating to? So a lot of the work we've been doing at the moment is moving into six, but we are, we have been exploring and are still exploring uh, sort of a web installation of seven as well. Um, I know the two are compatible, so we potentially um, have both available. Um, it's still something we're not quite settled on. And James Macklin wanted to know, how do you deal with historical specimens with many specimens and associated data on the same sheet? Many collection objects and on one preparation or many preparations on one collection object? It's something that we've still been wrangling with. So if any herbaria out there have worked out how to deal with this, it'd be great. Um, this is potentially where we could look at, we've considered containers. 
but it's kind of like a if we're having to use containers for one thing we couldn't use them for another so we've got to try and work out where we want to use them to try and manage this kind of data i think but yeah if any herbaria have tackled it and have any suggestions um just send us an email <laughs> we'd be we'd love to have a chat with you and try and figure it out <laughs> Uh, Volker Lorman wanted to know, are you using any kind of controlled vocabulary or thesaurus for the locality information? So at present in BG Base, there isn't. Um, if, depending on how we decide to handle it, once we've migrated, we may look at having um, a, a more controlled set of locality names, but it, that decision is still being made, so we need to kind of work out exactly where. Um, that change needs to be made. Um, yeah, it's something we were still considering. Uh, Rui, Rui, Rui wants to know, uh, you briefly mentioned that one driver to switch to specify were national requirements. Um, sorry, let me restate that. You, said, you briefly mentioned that one driver to switch to specify was national requirements. Could you elaborate a little bit more? So I wasn't, there's a, 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 national, a document that's been published by the Scottish government um, that is applicable to all of the Scottish public bodies. I've not actually seen the document. <laughs> um, I wasn't involved at the, the decision making phase. Um, I can, I think I've got a link to the document so I can um, try and paste it in so that you could have a look at it if it's of interest. Okay. And Mayor? I wanted to say it was a great talk and with the one-to-many ratio approach how will you handle loan on the items on one of the items yeah so each item at the moment is would be a preparation and this is where we have been working with specify to look at how to do this we'd um with the system as it is you can select individual preparations for loan so that's how we would be handling it um at present um just selecting the relevant one from the particular collection object. And Fritz Pratardo, um, sorry, I masked your name. If you use them, okay, if you use them, the one to many approach, what number will you use for linking all together? A traditional catalog number, um, and then use barcodes for individual preparations? If so, could it be confusing to maintain two different set of identifiers running in one collection? Yeah, so if we use the one to many approach that's what we'd be doing we'd have um, a running catalog number given to the collection objects and then we would maintain barcodes for the preparation levels it's very similar to what we have in bg base at the moment where each specimen record ha has its own id and the barcode is um, an additional field within that so in terms of maintaining the two sets i think most staff members currently aren't aware of what catalog number what specimen id is attached to a record we tend to refer to most of them by barcode and i think that would continue um, with that one-to-many approach and specify okay that is the last question that's great okay thank you thank you robin <laughs> so we have about <clears throat> one minute um we're, we're, we're tending to run a little bit ahead and we want to kind of stay on time for people who are coming in precisely at the time of the next talk. Um, so if anyone has any other questions, feel free to type them in. Like, um, there's a question, do your specimens have high resolution images, Robin? Uh, some of them do. We've got just over half, uh, about half a million have um, high resolution images and we're working our way through the rest of the collection. Um, so one day we'll have it for all of them, but we're about six of the way there at the moment. So <laughs> still a way to go. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to... Well, can we ask uh, Deb's question? Sure. Please, please, please. Absolutely. Deb Paul wants to know, are you using or storing OCR for images? So we, as standard, take OCR with every, every specimen we take a photo of has OCR stored. Um, it 
we've got a server that monitor it. it's stored separately to our collections management database but there's been development work by Martin Pullen to make the OCR data search via our online catalog so anything that's got an image you can you can use the OCR to search for it um, there's quite a large proportion of our specimens only have stub records um, just to try and get through the collections so it's a way of opening up data that's not currently being transcribed from the specimens. Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna um, go on to our, our next speaker. I think there might be one more question, but I'll let you answer that offline. Thank you. Our next speaker, Richard Radler, is the Senior Collection Manager and Research Scientist at the University of Michigan Herbarium. His presentation title is Digital Workflows using Specify at the University of Michigan. And let me pull up his screen. Yeah. Can you see it, Rich? Thank you very much for the introduction. And if I could have the next slide. We've been using Specify at various levels at the University of Michigan now for over 20 years. It's used in, was used in two, actually in three collections, only one of them for most of that period until 2015. Uh, one of the collections actually used it, it went back out of it, and now we've all come back into it. 2015, the decision was made by the College of Literature, Science, and Arts to adopt Specify across the natural history collections at the university, potentially including 17 million collection objects. The University of Michigan also decided to become one of the three charter founding members of the Specify Collections Consortium. Hearing some of the comments in Robin's talk reminded me of some of the things we went through in getting various databases into Specify. And uh, I, I, could, I could share some of those stories, but won't do that at the present time. Next slide, please. One of the things that really stimulated collection digitization, both at the University of Michigan and elsewhere, was the ADBC project that the National Science Foundation put together and announced in 2010. It was a 10-year project for competitive collaborative grants, fostering that digitization efforts. In 2011, the first of the uh, projects, the thematic collection networks were announced and the digitization hub known as iDigBio was also uh, created. Next slide, please. The U of M has been very successful in participating, although we've never led a thematic collection network. In 2012, we started work as collaborators in two of the first four TCNs the Plants, Herbivory, and Parasitoid Project, and the Lichens and Bryophytes. Since that time, we've been fortunate to participate in 10 additional TCNs, and one was known as a partner to an existing network or a PEN project. Five of those TCNs and one PEN are currently active. We have the Endless Forms Project, Overt, Pacific Island Land Snails, the Terrestrial Parasite Tracker, the Teridophyte Consortium Col Collections Consortium, and the PEN project called Funky, which is attached to the Overt project. Next slide, please. What I'd like to talk about today is how we've integrated Specify into the workflow of three of these current TCNs. First, I'll talk about the Insects project, the, the new terrestrial parasite tracker, and then I'll focus a little bit on the plant projects, both the endless forms and the pteridophytes. If I could have the next slide. For the terrestrial parasite tracker, the goal is to digitize parasite specimens that are mounted on glass slides and to go through about 180,000 of these slides over the course of three years. The starting point was associated lot numbers that were in a FileMaker database without either individual catalog numbers or current or recorded ter ter terminations. The information on those, about 60,000 of those lots was migrated to specify. And then when they're 
process in the individual slides, they'll add a unique catalog number with a scannable QR code of that catalog number and a human readable number to the individual slide. If I could have the next slide. Once we get to that particular part in the process, then specify is coming in to play. And you'll notice it says in specify six, we'll query for the existing lot information. We we'll use six, we'll then determine does the lot exist or doesn't it? If it's an existing lot, we'll go through specify six and we'll open the lot record, we'll edit it. We'll use carry forward to bring the information into a new collection record. And then the catalog number and the cataloger will be added into that new collection record along with any additional information we want to add at that point. We'll scan the QR code for to get some of the information in as well. We'll also go into VertNet and check to see if there's any host catalog numbers that have been assigned to uh, the host of that parasite. If it's a new lot, it will work in either specify six or seven to start a new collection record and record any information. In either case, whether it's new or existing, we'll then proceed to imaging the slide, associate the data with that image, and then the data will go up to the global, the global uh, biotic information portal, Globi, and also to GBIF via our internet publishing toolkit application at the U of M. Next slide. What have we learned as a, as a part of using Specify in this project? Uh, there's some advantages of six. The carry forward option can be used to easily create new records. The batch editing of data sets is very useful in six. The workbench allows much smoother batch data set uploads. There are some advantages of seven as well. It's faster entry of new records. Workers can continue to manage, can continue to work on their projects if the manager is working on six and uploads, et cetera. It's easier to view and manipulate trees in seven, but it's also easier for remote work if you're using seven, because in our case, we're running over a virtual public network, virtual private network, excuse me. And seven runs much faster than six in our particular instance. Next slide, please. The plant uh, projects are the ones that I'm more familiar with because I'm being a botanist that falls into my bailiwick. Uh, endless forms, we're working to digitize specimens from nine families of plants with extreme morphologies, succulents, carnivora, et cetera. About 70,000 specimens are involved at the University of Michigan Herbarium in this project. In the Pteridophyte TCN, we're working to digitize specimens, both fossil and modern, of ferns and their relatives. We're working with about 1,500 fossil collections from the Museum of Paleontology, as well as about 100,000 specimens eventually at the University of Michigan Herbarium. We're using the same workflow in both projects. Next slide, please. In this uh, workflow, first thing we're going to do is pre-curate the specimens. We're looking at name verifications. In the Pteridophy project, for example, we actually have a thesaurus that the project is using uh, across institutions to get current names on specimens. We're also looking in the collection for duplicate specimens that may exist and we're remo removing them before uh, proceeding. The next thing we would do is image the specimens, adding a barcode unless there's already one present. We've been involved in databasing and barcoding specimens at the University of Michigan for quite some time at, and under various projects and some things have barcodes already, others do not. It confuses the issue, as you'll see later on, in creating an additional workflow, but we've managed a way around it. And we specify using the work with the advent of the workbench, that's made it much easier as well. At the imaging step, we're recording the barcode and the ID in, into a skeletal CSV file. At that point, we attempt to upload the images into specify. This is where we get two categories into our workflows. If, and if there's no uh, existing specify record, the images won't load and they're going to be placed into a workbench file with the barcode and ID from that skeletal CSV we created. If the images do attach to an existing record, we'll transcribe those records more completely using the, the uh, newly attached images. 
if in those existing records, if there's any placeholder information, for example, locality information that we didn't enter earlier, that information can be loaded into uh, queries and we can, we can find those specimens easily. Next slide, please. Now we have our two categories of records, either new or existing. The new records, the manager in the project can create a workbench data set with the attached images. Then uh, ports that out to an assistance. The assistants receive the data sets. They can transcribe the data from the images. The one very important feature is they can batch fill information that's common to all specimens. For example, their cataloger name, uh, the cataloging date, things like that. They can then pass the data set back to the manager. The manager who verifies the data then can upload it to specify. If you have existing records, existing records, you have individual specify records are then going to be updated uh, in, within specify itself. In either case, the data is going to off to GBIF and to the Teridified portal via our IPT instance. Next slide, please. Some of the observations we've made by using specify in the plant projects. We're using six exclusively since in our, the workbench is not yet available in specify seven. Workbench data entry is much easier and much faster than entry through our collection object data form. In most of the, most of the plant TCN projects and also fungal projects so far, specify has been used fairly rarely. And that's probably because of a couple of features that if they existed, it would make it much more efficient. One of the things in herbaria work is duplicate matching is something that is very uh, commonly thought of as a time-saving feature because in many cases there are duplicate specimens at different herbaria and if one, one institution has entered the data, it makes sense to try to gather that data from them as well. Specify used to have a feature called scatter, gather, reconcile, which was developed at the U of M for an, during, for an earlier project. And if that still wasn't specify, or if there was a way to harvest data from symbiota portals, where a lot of this work has been done in the herbarium community, it would be much more efficient. If you could work collaboratively on georeferencing, for example, the Koji project that exists in some symbiota portals, but both of them would require being able to export and import, re export and re-import data records from specify. The other th thing that we've discovered is that the managers could batch edit all fields associated with the records, not just selected ones, it would allow a much easier updating of records and uh, incorporating new data that might be provided by either crowdsourcing or aggregator feedback. But we all know that editing all of the fields is also inherent with some uh, difficulties because of database structure. So that's another thing that would be nice to have, maybe eventually. Next slide, please. I'd like to acknowledge the National Science Foundation for all of the various grants we've been able to become a part of, and also LSA Technology Services for the technical support in both getting Specify going as a uh, product at the University of Michigan and continuing to host it and provide the technical support for us whenever they, wherever possible. Thank you very much. Doesn't look like we have any questions. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Rich? Uh, ben Norton wants to know, what are the advantages to using barcodes slash QR codes and readable specimen IDs on labels? I would say, the, the readable barcodes give, the human readable barcodes are very essential in a sense to get um, the information easily seen. And I know in the herbarium side of things, we're using those as a direct way of entering the data and also direct way of processing loan records. The, I'm less familiar with the QR code process I know in the case of the insect slides, there's not very much room on those labels in the first place on the slides for anything additional. So the idea of having something that's human readable still 
makes it easier rather than just assuming there's a barcode and wondering what it might contain. Okay, and Brenna Decker wanted to know how would a collection get involved with a TCN? Um, basically, the uh, project forms the, the I, a re, it's formed around a research idea of some sort, and people that are trying to formulate one know what collections might be useful in the project, might have information, might have collections that would be uh, either unique to a project or would add significant value to it. And then you essentially, we've been asked several times, oh, we know you have collections of X that would be very val valuable to our project. Would you uh, consider joining the project? Uh, I remember getting involved with the very first one. That's, we were asked, we, the organizers knew we had a major collection in some areas and we thought that they thought uh, it would be appropriate for us to participate. And then we've been asked on a couple of occasions for to participate and we just said, well, it would be difficult to get the information. We wouldn't really have that much to contribute. So we've turned down a couple of possibilities, but if we have a major holdings in our collections that we think would be useful and as a way of getting things accomplished, uh, we like to participate. Okay. Uh, the next question was from Stephen Rogers. He wants to know, he says, I had thought some of the vertebrate collections were on EMU. If that is true, how easy was it to switch to specify? The, at one point, the collections at U of M, there was going to be a move to go to EMU and uh, the decision was almost made to go that direction. And at the, I'm, I can't say at the last minute, but it was close to then. There was a, a reversal in the decision and then uh, we went into specify instead. So actually the discussions about going, getting into databases, getting into specify at the U of M actually now, if I remember right, go back about 18 years when there was an earlier discussion and EMU was on the table, specify was on the table, and we me we've measured some of the pros and cons of going which direction. And uh, in our most recent uh, discussions in 2015, uh, those same factors came up again. And uh, when you look at, if you look at Randy, Spears, Randy uh, Singer's presentation, you'll note that uh, some of the things that he brings up in that presentation will give you some indication of what we went through in terms of trying to decide between those two as well. Okay, the next question is from Sarah Phillips. She wants to know, are there advantages to implementing all of the functionality in six you found of advantages in seven? Using six and seven, some of the collections are mostly using six, some are mostly using seven. And I've used six and seven to some extent. What I've found is when, if you get comfortable in one of them like six, then you have to think very carefully, well, how do you do the same thing in seven? And one of the things that I think is we've discovered is in a couple of cases, things are not developed between the two equally. And so when you do something in six, they say, oh, how do I do this in seven? And in many cases, there's a, there is a way to do it, but in some cases, like the workbench is still being developed in seven. And uh, some of the features are just a little bit different. The web applications in seven or the web would be very useful to, to be able to do some of those things, for sure. Okay, and the last question that we have time for is from Volker Lorman. He wants to know, he says, thanks for your talk. And do you have separate databases for plants and insects, et cetera, or do you, all, do you have it in a single database? What are the reasons for that approach? The reasons for this, the reasons for the structure at the U of M are partly historic. Right now we have a separate one for the herbarium, which includes the plants and fungi. And we have a separate instance for the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology. 
Actually, there's two inside the zoology because the mollusk collection had been in specified for quite a while, and they actually have a, a separate instance from the rest of the Museum of Zoology. Then the Museum of Paleontology is also going to have a separate instance. Um, a lot of this comes about from historical um, precedent of what was existing at the time and how was it thought best to get some of these features, get some of the collections in place. Uh, transferring them from their, from their earlier databases into Specify was a long process uh, and uh, it wasn't necessary, and they were coming in from different, different places or different databases. FileMaker was one of them that was being used. Uh, and so I think historic press, the history of the collections at the time led to our current structure, which does have some inherent disadvantages and inherent advantages. We're actually thinking about revising that structure slightly um, now as well. Thank you so much, Rich. And we see that there are quite a few other questions. Um, if, if you'd like to answer them kind of offline while we move to the next presentation, that would be great. Or um, sure. I'm sure you wouldn't mind people contacting you afterward. Oh, sure. Thank you so much. Our next speaker hails from the University of Colorado Museum of Natural History, where she is the collection manager for invertebrate paleontology. Of course, she is none other than Spinach's own Talia Karim, who will present what happens when you let an ecologist loose on your specified database, semi-automated data cleaning using R. Sorry. There we go. Awesome, thank you, Teresa. Um, and thanks to the Specify folks for um, organizing the session. Um, like a lot of our speakers, I've been using Specify for quite a while, um, probably since about 2010. Um, and I was um, working at Kansas for a couple years when we were migrating into six. So um, I've mostly used Specify six. Um, and yeah, so thank you guys for all the work you do. So today I'd like to talk about um, exactly what I, the title says, what happens when you let an ecologist loose on your specified database. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge that a lot of this work is by my co-author, Adrian Carper, um, who's worked on and off on the Fossil Insect Collaborative TCN project. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as some of our previous speakers um, have talked about, um, large database and large data projects inherently suffer from a lot of logistical hurdles and constraints. Um, so some of these, you know, we have huge numbers of records that you're dealing with, which requires a lot of data processing time. Um, you have multiple associated objects, which leads to thousands of associations that you're trying to track um, and keep together. Um, you have a lot of personnel over the course of one of these TCM projects, um, such as the ones Rich was ta were talking about. Um, you have the logistical constraint that you end up with a lot of user and operational error. Um, the Fossil Insect Collaborative has been going on for more than five years now. And over that time, we've had, you know, a dozen or so grad students and undergrads working on the project. Um, and that leads to a lot of um, turnover in users and operational error. Um, next slide, please. All right, so this is a diagram of our workflow for the Fossil Insect TCN. And for this talk, um, I wanna focus on the logistical issues of how to actually perform the data quality checks on the specimen images that are attached to our records in our specified database. So that's sort of the step that's in the, the red circle there, that part of the workflow. Next slide, please. So we are currently wrapping up um, the Fossil Insect Collaborative project this month. Um, just at University of Colorado Invertebrate Paleontology, we have over 61,000 individual image attachment records in specified just for this project. Um, and all of those need to be verified in some way. So how do you even start to verify 61,000 image attachments? So last fall, I talked to uh, Adrian Carper, 
who's a postdoc in entomology at CU. Um, and I asked if he could start working on this massive task. Uh, Adrian is trained as an entomologist and as an ecologist. And I thought when we hired him to work on this project that he would be wearing his entomologist hat and come in and help and look at the images and make sure that if it was a beetle record that we had a beetle image attached and so forth. But instead, Adrian came in with his ecologist and data analytics hat on. Next slide, please. So for Adrian, when he approached um, this question of trying to verify all these attachments, um, he started with his data analytics hat. So he started exploring um, some of the data in Excel, um, which is very standard for him. Um, and he started looking at some of those data quality control issues there rather than individually looking at each record and specify. So some of the pros of um, looking at data quality in Excel, um, so Excel is pretty easy. I think we, most of us know how to use Excel. Um, it still costs something, but a lot of us have a university license that um, you know, allows for us to have Excel. Um, there's a nice graphical user interface, which is pretty easy to use. Um, and there's pretty low training investment. Um, most students, grad students, um, collection managers can use Excel. Um, we have some idea of how it works. But as a lot of you who have used Excel for um, data cleaning and managing data know that there are a lot of um, operational errors that can happen. How a lot of us have had, you know, that student that sorted your Excel file wrong and all your data is screwed up. Um, so there are definitely some cons there. Uh, next slide, please. So Adrian then moved out of Excel um, and looked at some of the steps he was using to explore um, the attachment data. He looked at those in R. So R is a very standard um, tool for ecologists. So this was um, just a no brainer for him. So as you see, there are a lot of pros to actually coding the data processing and exploration steps in R rather than Excel. So um, it allows you to track all your changes. Um, there is some moderate training investment involved. It's free, it's open source, um, and all your steps and your operational errors are tracked in the code, um, which is a really big plus. Um, of course, the main con is that it requires more skilled personnel. And at least in my case, R isn't a skill that I currently have. And I think a lot of collection managers um, don't have that skill at the moment. Next slide, please. All right, so um, based on these initial explorations last fall, um, Adrian and I did a lot of bouncing back and forth of data, um, exporting data from Specify, testing our workflow in Excel, and then coding in R. And we collaborative develop, collaboratively developed um, a semi-automated workflow to explore the image attachments and their associations and specify. And this slide just shows a summary of sort of the main steps in that workflow. And if we go to the next slide, um, we have that same workflow, but in more of a graphic form. I think we're all familiar with these graphic workflows by now. Um, and what I'll do over the course of the next few slides is just go through these steps in a little more detail and show you the details specifically for this project. Uh, next slide, please. So we started with building a query and specify um, that would export the data we wanted to examine in R. And in this case, we needed to check the catalog number for the records against the catalog number and the original file name for the image attachment. Um, we also keep some information about associated specimen records in a comments field, so that field was also exported. Next slide, please. Then in R, Adrian summarized um, and explored the data sets. Um, he used the stringer package in R to extract, to extract strings of text from the original file names of the images and from the comments field. So for this example here, we have an original file name for the image attachment, and you can see it's a long string with a lot of information in it. 
Um, but really all we wanted for our QC purposes was the catalog number, which you can see highlighted in red. Next slide, please. So once we have extracted uh, the bits of data that we want, we can explore the associations. So this is a pretty straightforward one. Um, so does the catalog number in the UCM field match what's in the original file name for catalog number? So this is the most basic association where we have a one-to-one -one relationship between an image and a specimen record in Specify. Next slide, please. Um, but with fossil insects, things get a little more complicated because we often have a many-to-one relationship between specimen records and specify and a single image. So here's a slab of fossil insects and you can see there's at least four insect specimens here, but there's only one image. So this one image would need to get attached to four different records and specify. Next slide, please. So when exploring these types of associations, we have to dig into the comments field um, and examine information about the range of associated catalog numbers, um, which you can see highlighted in red there from the comments. And we're also given a cue in the original file name with the word habitus. Um, and for us, this means that the image uh, contains more than one catalog specimen. So that was a decision we made at the very start of the project when we um, came up with our file naming process. Um, and it's an indication to us that, again, there's more than one specimen in that image. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to summarize, um, once we've explored those types of associations that I mentioned, we can identify what we presume to be correct associations based on the data we have. So file name, the catalog number in the file name matches what's in the UCM field. Um, and then we can parse out mis the mistakes into different categories and then even further into levels of expertise with the collection that are required to resolve the questions. So maybe some of them are really straightforward. Adrian can work on those. And then the more complicated ones, maybe where somebody actually needs to go in the collection and verify something against an actual specimen, um, I can do those. So this frees up me being the bottleneck in the quality control process. Next slide, please. So just to show you what a massive time savings um, this semi-automated workflow is, um, we had, like I said, just over 61,000 image attachments to verify and specify. And using this workflow, the semi-automated workflow, we got that down to only about 700 attachments that needed individual verification. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is just a pie chart uh, summarizing those data. And we can see it's only about 2% of the image attachments that are potentially problematic. So instead of trying to open up every single one of those 61,000 records and verifying those image attachments, um, we're, only, we're down to like about 700, which is a number I can get my head around and I think is manageable. So just to sum up, um, this type of workflow can really reduce time um, and error in your data verification process on, at the end of one of these um, large digitization projects. Um, the benefit of having it in R is once you have your code, it's coded, you can run it periodically for updated database um, as you continue to add data. Um, and you can adapt it and tailor it to different database needs. Um, and I would just like to thank uh, University of Colorado um, the Specify folks um, and NSF for funding. Oh, sorry, next slide, Teresa, or, or Noreen, sorry. Um, and yeah, and then the next slide. Um, and if you have questions um, about the code, um, feel free to email Adrian. Um, he's happy to share this. Um, and it's pretty adaptable, I think, to do um, with really any kind of data quality, data cleaning project. Thanks. Thank you, Talia. Uh, Ron Eng wants to know, are you going to learn R? Um, I would love to learn R. And maybe um, after I'm done organizing the spinach, co-organizing the spinach conference, I will do that this summer. <laughs> uh, Matthias Dillon wants to know, is the code available on GitHub? Um, not currently, but we are going to put it on GitHub. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to put it on mine or Adrian's. Um, 
but yes, we want to make that available um, so other people can use this for sure. So I can, um, yeah, we'll put it on GitHub. It, it's going to be on GitHub, yes. Alex Hardesty wants to know, how do you identify each specimen in the fossil file image and associate it to their corresponding specify record? Do you segment the image? That's a great question. Um, we do not segment um, the images. Um, we have talked about that. Um, I've also thought about annotating the images. Um, so I saw a great talk from somebody at NHM London about 10 years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, and they were annotating images that way, um, but we're not doing that currently. Uh, a team member once said, it might be nice to publish the R code in a Jupyter notebook. I don't know what that is, but I will make a note of that. <laughs> okay. Uh, Christos, I cannot pronounce your last name, I'm so sorry, uh, asked, have you found any non-matching items in cases not identified by R, like random checks? Or did you rely solely on what R told you? Um, we have found uh, non-matching items on random checks. So one of the first things we started doing, um, for those of you who use specify um, and use the attachment server, um, one of the first things we actually did in this workflow was <clears throat> You know how you can bring up all the images in the like the attachment view thing and you get like the gallery view of all the attachments. Um, we actually started by doing that and looking for all the attachments that gave you an error. So the ones with the red box or the red X. Um, because we had a few students that um, Didn't have the attachment server pathway set up correctly and they had uploaded several hundred attachments. So we started by identifying those. And then um, we also um, went through and identified things that were attached twice. So we had a couple of students that would, you know, maybe upload the same folder of images twice. Um, so there's a lot of categories of error um, that we were able to identify through this project. Lauren Gardner would like to know, did you look at using OpenRefine to clean and check your data? Was R more appropriate for what you needed to do in this work? Sure. Um, R is really, I think, more appropriate for this project. Um, we have used OpenRefine um, for on the, like, before we import data. Um, so Rich was talking about using the workbench to import data. Um, when we have a data set that's um, sort of created outside specify, we have used OpenRefine um, to clean those types of data sets before we bring them in. Um, but for this project, it was more about trying to identify records that needed to be verified and R allowed us to like sort of parse those out and get rid of a huge chunk of things that um, looked like they were correct associations. And the last question for now, Vicki Wang said 61,000 images. Wow. Um, what was your procedure for attaching all of these? And did you use the batch attachment tool or another process? Are the images yeah. accessed by access copies? Sorry. Or do you also attach the high quality archival and files? Yeah. So um, we do use the batch upload feature. Um, so we use the mapping file um, because like I said, we have um, a many to one relationship sometimes. So sometimes we may have one image and there's 10 insects that have, are associated with 10 records. So one image might get uploaded 10 times and be associated with um, those 10 records. Um, so we use the batch upload using um, the mapping file for catalog number to upload. Um, and we do upload the high resolution images. We don't um, upload a lower, well, it's a high resolution JPEG. It's not a super low resolution JPEG or anything. Okay, hey, thank you so much, Talia. Thanks. <laughs> All right. 
Our next speaker is Randy Singer, Collection Manager of Fishes and Assistant Research Scientist at the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology. Randy will be asking and discussing what does the perfect database look like? Oh, thank you, Noreen. And uh, thank you everybody for attending and thanks for Specify for uh, organizing this. Um, if you would have told me that I'd be giving a conference talk with a cat on my lap, I would have thought you were crazy, but you know, this might be a first, I don't know. Um, so today I'm gonna be posing the question, what does the perfect database look like? And it's definitely somewhat of a rhetorical question. And it's something that I think a lot of us think about in our daily work, you know, in museums is like, you know, I'm using this system. Is it the best system? What could, what could be changed? What could be added? And I did a lot of talking to a lot of different people. And a lot of you might've received emails from me just, you know, asking you random questions over the past couple months. Um, and this is sort of all of that information culminated into a uh, stream of consciousness sort of presentation where I'm going to show you guys what people have said about their current databases and what maybe what are some characteristics that might contribute to the quote unquote perfect database. All right. So uh, next slide, please. So yeah, I'm just going to start off by showing a little bit about, you know, what are we working with now? Um, I, have, I, I don't know if some of you participated in an NH call uh, survey I did a while ago asking what databases you use and a lot of people took that survey and I'm really fortunate to get some data from you guys um, and also lots of feedback on the things that you liked or didn't like about your database. Then I'm going to go over uh, a little bit about what people expressed that they need from a database whether or not their database is actually giving them that that's a different story but they, these are things that people really want um, in the collections community. And then I'm gonna end hopefully with just talking about some of the core components of what we might call a perfect database. Next slide, please. So what are we working with now? We all know that there's, you know, Emu, there's Specify, Arctos. Some people are still on punch cards. Maybe some people don't even have their data in a database. Gasp, you know. Um, but basically, um, I think the, the general move and the general consensus is that our data need to be digitized and they need to be in a computerized, um, preferably machine readable fashion. So um, next slide, please. So um, I did that survey I was telling you guys about and uh, next slide. If we got about 209 responses from the NH call uh, listserv and uh, this is what the uh, responses look like. So the overwhelming majority of people, well not overwhelming, but the majority of people use specify um, we've got some EMU users, Arctos, et cetera, and it kind of filters down uh, to the bottom. But uh, next slide. But the thing that's really interesting to me, next slide, is the other. So a lot of people are actually using customized databases. And this was actually really surprising to me. You know, when you have all of these people working really hard out there trying to bring you the best and brightest database for collections management software, why are there so many people that are developing their own in-house relational databases? And so this got me thinking about, you know, what, what is the perfect database? What does it look like? Why haven't we achieved a uniformed across all institutions database? And uh, what the, I think the best way to start this is by looking at some of the big players. So we'll go to the next slide. So the top, top four management software, if you will, uh, that people use were Specify, Arctos, uh, Emu, and then actually like a smattering, if you added them all together of like Microsoft and other kind of standardized software like Access, Excel, and FileMaker. So we'll just kind of focus on those. Next slide. So at their core, they all kind of look very similar. You know, you have this like library-esque, you know, interface where you type in some, some something and you you know it's in a field you have a very basic gui or you know user interface um but at their core if you kind of squint they all kind of look the same so that we definitely have that down you know <laughs> it's like this is the this is this is what a, a collections management database looks like with the exception being excel um which is actually just like a table essentially and these other data these other relational databases basically just query tables in excel all right so next slide please 
So, but what they all do at their core is somebody collects data, you format that data, you add your data to a, your database, and then maybe you do something to share it, whether that means sending it to an aggregator or getting an Excel sheet to send to somebody or, or exporting some images or something like that. Um, next slide. But most databases really only focus on this section. You know, they deal with the data that you have put in or help you put the data in the database, and then they do something to help you export it. And so that's kind of the area I'm focusing on and for the feedback that I've gotten from people. All right, next slide. So what unique services do each database officer offer? This is based on feedback from people. I said, you know, why do you like specify? What about specify, uh, you know, was something that you like? So, okay, so next slide. So it has an app. There's both cloud-based and local clients. It's free, with a, but with a sliding scale for larger institutions, you know, you can buy into the, the consortium. Um, it has an intuitive interface with color-coded buttons and coordinating tables that, you know, can match up to these different colored buttons to kind of help the user, you know, know, like I know that locality is blue, you know, things like that. Um, a fully editable taxonomic tree that's set up in a phylogenetic tree fashion, which is really intuitive for people too. Um, the ability to integrate with a web, your website using the web interface, so you can have a web client, so people could actually search either a version of your database or your actual database um, from your website. And there's a cool workbench function um, where you can actually enter a, d a data spreadsheet for cataloging. Next slide. Um, EMU, next slide. Uh, they have on-call customer service, which is probably one of the biggest things that people appreciate about EMU. They're usable across multiple disciplines, so you can have like one system for your entire museum. It has multi-platform apps. Um, it actually supports Unicode for most languages, so if you are, your record is in, you know, Cantonese or whatever, you can actually have the characters to match up to those localities and things like that. Um, and it's media managed in the same database, so everything is all connected. And you can do this cool thing called narratives. So you can talk about the collection history of an object. So including like, how, how many times has this jar of, of fish has been topped off? How many times has this skeleton been, you know, cleaned out, checked for bugs, things like that, which I think is kind of cool. All right, next slide. Arctos. So I'll, I'll admit, I didn't really know much about Arctos. And when I started looking into it for this, uh, project. I actually was really surprised, next slide, about the services that Arctos offers. So they're fully cloud-based. It's a web application. You can access it, your database from anywhere. It has an extremely um, tight-knit user community online, and I think this is something that, that we should all strive for um, in each community um, of database folks. They have holistic fields for both, e both e ecological and behavioral data. You can easily edit the schema, edit the schema with some entry code. Um, there's intuitive links for sequences to GenBank. You can link out because it's all web-based. You can do actual linking. There's, um, and you can also provide DOIs for a specific specimen, which is really cool. So you can be like, come check out this specimen. Here's a DOI, look at it. Um, and then specimen citations can also be linked from record too. So you can kind of link up like it's been in this paper. Here's the paper, link out to it immediately from the web. All right, next slide. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, next slide, because we know that it's familiar. You don't get any IT support with these types of things. And let's be honest, most people use FileMaker, Access, and Excel purely out of familiarity, or maybe they just don't have the lack of, they have the lack of support to transition to another system. Um, one thing I will say is that, ex, uh, that Access and FileMaker do have a lot of customizability. So if you really wanna make your uh, tables and things look however you want it, you can do that with, with coding. All right, next. So what are the things people don't like? Now I'll say these are things that I've heard from people, like heard verbally. So some of them may not exactly be true or, or, or might be a little bit off, but this is what the community thinks about each of these databases based on what I've talked to people. So specify, heavily relying on in-house IT for, tr for troubleshooting. Yes, there is a support system, but people say that to edit things, you need to have an IT professional in your inst institution. There, it's hard for users to roll back mistakes after you actually commit the record to the database without, again, talking with your um, IT folks at your institution. It has limited batch editing of existing records. Media requires, an, usually it requires an attachment server. Um, sometimes the workbench um, uploads don't match correctly to your fields at that specific time. And if you match it wrong, you got to go back and remap everything. And then editing schemas and forms requires um, another separate program to specify um, I forget, I'm forgetting what it's called now, but there's another program to edit the schema within specify. So emu, 
Um, very expensive. It's a proprietary software. Uh, you, you can't even watch a demo of it without signing up for the email list, which I thought was hilarious. Uh, the UI is a little old and outdated and uh, too many tabs and no, not really much customization. Arctos, um, no, it, I don't think there's an option for a local database and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. That's, I couldn't find anything about that. Um, it doesn't seem to have any apps and you can only moderately customize the UI. You can only, you can mainly customize the schema. And then the other, uh, other top types of stuff we won't really even focus on because I don't have much time. So next slide, please. Um, so what do people say in the survey? All right, go ahead and, and just hit through these. Um, and I'll just say these are some of the comments we got back. The general consensus is that most people pick their database based around cost, what they know is available, and how easily they can use it. Um, many institutions actually used more than one type. Oh, actually, can you go back one? Sorry. Used more than one type of database for each collection, which also was surprising for me. Um, all respondents like one or more, one or fewer features offered by their data management software. Um, I was surprised by the amount of in house. Uh, databases, like I said. Um, everybody wants the ability to batch edit existing records. Everybody wants to be able to easily track the location of their collection items. And everybody wants some form of IT support and community support. So they really want to feel like they're a part of a community that's doing the same thing. And I think that's really honestly why Specify, for example, has done particularly well because it's a, it's a system that's it's easy to get into and a lot of people use it. So there's a lot of ways to talk about it. And then my favorite quote from someone was, you know, why is everybody using, trying to reinvent the damn wheel? They know what we want, you know? So that's the question I'm gonna pose um, in the next slide. And so what do we need? Data, the database, database need to stay low cost or no cost, preferably. They need to be usable without much IT infrastructure, uh, but they can be enhanced by it, for example. Um, strong ability to handle media, easy to publish to aggregators, has a modern and intuitive UI and is accessible remotely via apps smooth process for cataloging, like entering a sheet or georeferencing some of your records. Batch editing is important. Um, it's great to be able to do a modular type query where you wanna look for this and this and this in multiple tables and get multiple results back. And the ability to track objects like for loans and things like that. Um, and like I said, stressing the vibrant active community for troubleshooting. Next slide. So I'll bring you back to what I was, I started off with where I talked about, you know, the idea of what you interact with when you do a database. So um, next slide. So we focus that most databases seem to focus on this sort of realm of, of interacting with your data or your collections. Next slide. But wouldn't it be more interesting if a collections database offered some type of interface for being in the field and actually collecting your data and it would be reformatting it for entry when you get back. Next slide. And it would be great if there was some sort of assistance and formatting before you even get home so you don't have any type of um, user entry errors or any all the clunkiness of trying to map up your different fields. And maybe you could throw up an exclamation point if something looks strange, like you've collected a locality before. Other collections have input something from that locality before and it could query those localities and tell you, hey, are you sure you meant here? Maybe you meant here. Um, next slide, please. And then, you know, when you work with IPT, a lot of people seem to be um, relatively intimidated by it and confused by it. Um, next, next slide. And this is the way you actually export your data to a data aggregator. Wouldn't it be awesome if there was some sort of like, you know, shiny GUI sort of um, click click button sort of you um, way to work with the inter interact with IPT. So that way you could easily um, drag and drop things that you want. Um, it would, and in the same, uh, realm, it'd be great if you could do the same thing within your database, like drag and drop fields, change the way they look for each individual user. Um, next slide, please. And so that just leaves me with, you know, we have all of these ideas. The community definitely knows, seems to know what they want when it comes to databases. So how do we, how do we get, how do we get this to happen? How do we inspire others to create this, uh, you know, these types of services that we want. And I guess the, my, my answer would, my simple answer would be having discussions, doing things like this to keep, keep checking in with what we want, what we need and what we have. Um, next slide, please. And with that, I just want to thank everybody who helped me put this together, the organizers, my wife and children who put up with me being locked in a room for several hours during the day. Um, and with that, I will end. Um, Thank you, Randy. Does anybody have any questions for Randy? Yes, 
Ryan Allen asked, did the NH call survey get many herbaria responses? Symbiota seems really low. Yeah, and actually I wanted to mention that too. So I know that some people are going to be a little hurt by the fact that, you know, I didn't mention symbiota too much. And I will say that I did take into account um, there was a strong herbaria bias in the verbal responses that I got. And I tried to include some of the features that are in symbiota in the things that would be in a perfect database, like one of them being uh, the, what Rich mentioned, actually, the idea of a scatter gather reconcile. So, you know, a lot of times in herbaria, they have um, a record that's parsed out into many, or a specimen that's parsed out into many different institutions. And they, they would love the ability to grab all of those data and pull them in and use them to create new records or, or whatever. And I think that's, that's what Arctos has down to. I wanted to mention that too, is you can actually search across multiple Arctos databases because all of them are linked on the Arctos site. And so that's a feature I think is really interesting. And Cody Thompson, I'm sure you're familiar with, asked, <laughs> so what is the perfect database? There, there is no perfect database. And um, I think that all of, all of them, the ones that exist currently are trying to make positive changes and I think maybe someday we'll be there but we're, we're still working on it obviously. Okay, Elspeth, um, sorry, Elspeth I only know one so I, sorry. Elspeth Haston said, would it be interesting to see similar surveys from other parts of the world? Would bring in a lot of other software. Any plans? Yeah, no, that would be, that would be interesting. So the, I don't, is NH call, is N NH call is at least Canada, because I got some responses from Canada, but I don't know if it's, is it, is it actually international? Does anybody know? Because I mean, I got, I know I got responses from at least from Canada, but yeah, you're right. I would, I would like to expand it um, and learn more about what, like, you know, I heard the, somebody talk uh, earlier, I think it was Robin from S Scotland. I didn't even know what deep, G, G, B, D, B, whatever that database system was. So it'd be interesting to learn more. Oh, and somebody mentioned that DISCO, which is a European organization, did a survey a few years ago as well. Oh, cool. Yeah. And several people are mentioning that NH Call is international. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I guess presumably we got at least some. Okay. Um, so Fritz Pertado. Richardo, uh said, what have you seen about databases that are more friendly for the use of barcodes than others, i.e. maintaining relationships between all preparations while allowing for individual and flexible management of each preparation? For example, I feel that Specify was primarily done to link preparations with other catalog, whether some others like Brahms was developed mainly to use barcodes. Yeah, personally, I didn't necessarily notice any more or less functionality with barcodes across any of the databases. I feel like it's it's more linked to a label, like labeling, um, like you know how you make your labels and things like that, and how you link it with it. So I, I can't really comment on that, but or which one does it better um, per se. I will say, speaking from Specify's perspective, yeah. you can scan barcodes into almost any of our text fields, and you can search based on barcodes and link records like loans based on barcodes. So for specify you can do that. I'm not familiar with Brahms enough to mention that. Okay, Tommy McGrath, sorry, I butchering these names. I'm so sorry, people. Uh, perhaps it would be worth checking the other category to see if any of those up and coming database solutions meet or are attempting to meet the criteria you outlined. And I didn't say that, and but some of the feedback I got where people went into great detail. So I appreciate if any of you are here, the people that went into great detail about what their institutional uh, proprietary or whatever you want to call it in-house database did. Um, and it sounds like they had very active um, IT department within their museum and they basically, you know, short order cooked up whatever they wanted. And it was really interesting to see the types of things that those in-house systems could do. Okay. Alex Hardesty said, you mentioned Arctos providing DOIs for specific specimens. In DISCO, we propose an instantly recognizable natural science identifier, NSID, as the global unique identifier for specimens. Would that be a useful differentiator from everything else that is identified by DOIs? 
Yeah, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't hurt to have a, our own community identifier, but I think the the bonus of having a DOI is it just it means so much more even outside of our community. Um, you know, anybody can interact with the DOI and and follow that follow that trail. Whereas if we start you know, using NSIDs or something like that and give up on the idea of DOIs, maybe somebody who wouldn't discover our data uh, would normally discover our data wouldn't. But that's just part of my own personal feeling. Okay, and I'm told this has to be the last one. Um, Lindell Bade asked, hey, Randy, are you going to try to publish your responses from the survey? I'd love to be able to dig into it in more detail. I think if I was going to publish it, I would do it not on a straw poll. So I think if I did it again, I would do it in a more um, organized fashion. If you're interested in working that, I'll, I'll be happy to work with you on it, like making like a real Qualtrics survey with actual validation um, and things like that. But this was basically just casting a, a net into the wind kind of deal. Thank you so much, Randy. There's a lot of interest in your talk. Cool. Um, Thanks, guys. There are some questions we didn't get to. Please feel free to answer them um, now, or I'm sure you're um, comfortable with people uh, contacting you afterward. Of course, yeah. Okay, okay, fantastic. Thank you. With that, we now round off our session with a thought provoking presentation by Leslie Skabinski, Collections Manager at the Paleontological Research Institution. Leslie's talk is titled, Publishing Fuzzy Data to the Web Portal, Why We Truncate. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. Uh, sorry. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we are. Yes, all right, Leslie. All right, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, publishing fuzzy data to the web portal and why we truncate. Uh, first, a little background. Next slide, please. Uh, PRI, the Paleontological Research Institution, is part of a National Science Foundation, NSF, Thematic Collections Network, PCN, that goes by the acronym EPICC, which stands for the Eastern Pacific Invertebrate Communities of the Cenozoic that together are digitizing 1.6 million marine invertebrate fossils from the west coast of the Americas, from Alaska to Chile. And as part of our grant obligations, we must publish our data records to the Integrated Digitized BioCollections IDIG Bio Data Aggregator. Because we are part of the PCN, we wanted to publish our records so that they contain similar high quality data. And we agreed to um, data standards on Things like photography standards, taxonomic authorities, but when it came to georeferencing the estimated 35,000 localities, we didn't know quite what standards to follow. Next slide, please. So there aren't, there were at that point in time, at that point in time, no community standards, though various groups and individuals were beginning to try to come up with guidelines. Some were advocating complete open access. Others were trying to assign high and low significance to sites, taking into account the full scope of what was known about a site, i.e. archeology, span threatened and endangered species, geologic sensitivity, public versus private land. And then there was the conundrum of what about if the land was private when the specimen was collected and is now public? We also heard stories of private lands being trespassed on by people who got the coordinates from museum websites. Finally, many of the sites had already been published in the literature and were available for all to see. So through much discussion, it was decided that we, the most prudent course of action was to publish truncated, not rounded coordinates to a tenth of a degree with a standard error radius of 5,566 meters, which is approximately 640 acres or one section for each site. And just as importantly, to document what we had done in the data record. Next slide, please. This is a, a, a screenshot of our web portal, the PRI web portal map showing our, showing um, the, geo, the geo references that we have in there so far. So truncated coordinates uh, do allow the record to be plotted on the map and users can get a general idea of locality. Within our database, we geo reference our localities to the highest precision possible 
with the smallest error radius possible. However, we did not want to store two sets of coordinates. Next slide, please. This is the data exporter, the specified data exporter with some of the mappings that we have. Now to publish our records to our web portal, we use the specified data exporter application. There are various steps to follow and we will not be flipping back and forth between this slide and the next slide, but I wanted to put this up in case anyone wants to refer to it later. Next slide. So this is how we truncate our data and publish to, the, to our web portal. We have, we make, within specify itself, we make, save, and run the mapping in the schema mapper. We close the schema mapper, log into the specify data export application, build or update the appropriate mapping. And the important part is we quit the exporter after mapping it, after the mapping is up to date, log into MySQL to access the database directly, pick the correct file, that's the mapping name, paste the MySQL update query into the command line interface and execute. After that's happened, we exit MySQL, we open the specified data exporter, and we um, select the appropriate mapping and choose export for web portal. In the white box, you can see this is the, the, the MySQL update query that we run. It truncates our latitude and our longitude and makes up every uncertainty radius to be 5,566 meters, where latitude, where there is something in, in the latitude and longitude. Next slide, please. One of the most important things is to let your public know what has, if you've been manipulating your data. So to that end, we have several pieces of metadata that we attach to each record in our web portal and on the data aggregators. So I have to say that we are using specify six and that we are, you can use specify six, you go into the system, system setup, configuration, and an institution menu. And we provide information about our terms of use, which points to our data use policy on our website, our license, which our data and photographs are all Creative Commons zero, no restrictions. And we add information in the information withheld field saying that all of our, that our coordinates have been truncated and that more information may be available. Next slide, please. So once again, here is the MySQL update query. Here's my information if anybody was interested in, in talking to me. And I'd like to acknowledge Greg Deedle, Vicki Wong, Brian Golems, and the FDTCN members, especially if Edward Davis from the University of, of Oregon, who wrote this, the um, upgrade. And uh, Kathy Hollis, Ron Eng, Patricia Holroyd, Christine Garcia, and of course, the Specify Collections Consortium. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. That was awesome. Um, does anybody have any questions for Leslie? Leslie, are there any standards for um, for how to how to publish your latitudes and longitudes? They um, there are many <laughs> different groups. Um, just uh, different groups uh, like uh, SVP, um, Society of Vertebrate Paleontology has, uh, has put out some guidelines. Um, there are some other, uh, uh, Susan Butts and Chris Norris have written about having open access and having everything be um, available. Uh, there's some other uh, there are other um, things available at different places. I believe GBIF has some stuff written on it about the uh, about standards, but there has not been a, a can, as far as I know, but I do know that the community is really uh, working on this right now. But as far as I know, there's no common community standard. Thank you. And Ben Norton asked why you decided to truncate 
to truncate to one decimal place? Um, you know, I can't really remember why we decided that. I think part of it was that we were, um, we didn't want to be too precise, but we also wanted it to be, um, uh, how to say this? Uh, we were we were good uh, with with tenth. We thought getting a little bit more precise would be would not be what we wanted to do. Uh, we were also at that point in time. Kathy Hollis at the uh, Smithsonian was is part of our TCN, and we were um, she brought up the idea, and we all kind of agreed to it within the Epic TCN. Right and. Deb Paul wants to know, how do you track vert or vet or vet requests for the non-truncated data? Oh, Deb. <laughs> we, this is still a conundrum. Um, we look at each request as a, as a um, chance to look at what we know about the site and what we know perhaps about the person. Um, we are not, uh, we, we try very hard not to be um, biased in, in who we give information to because it, as I said, many times it's already been published. We've just decided that on our, on our database and our public database that we would not um, publish full localities. Okay, and John Torgerson wanted to know why you decided to truncate your original data rather than truncating it during the data poll. I'm not sure if I quite understand that, that question. What do you mean by the data poll? Uh, and John, can you give a little bit inf more information either in the chat or I'm trying to find you, but I can't find you to unmute you. There's John. I'll unmute John. Okay, somebody else did. Hi. Um, yeah, I was just wondering why you decided to truncate your original data rather than say when you're going to share that data out to a data consolidator, just truncating in the query that, that exported the data. I don't know that we can actually truncate it within the specified data exporter. I've, Teresa, maybe you. Can answer that question? I actually, I actually believe John would know more about that than I do. Um, yeah. So, um, for instance, at the University of Michigan, when they export to the IPT server, the Integrated mm -hmm. Publishing Toolkit, there's a query that pulls that information directly from Specify and then sends it to the IPT and therefore out to the world through GBIF. Um, in that query, the exact same update query that you just showed us could be used to truncate that data at the time of export. That way the original data is preserved in its original state. Um, and you could do the same thing, say if you were exporting it to an Excel uh, spreadsheet and then sharing it out to data aggregators, you could in the Excel spreadsheet truncate it at that time and preserve your original data in its original state. So I was just wondering what you guys felt was preferable about amending the original data and having it in the database that way. Um, we do not uh, store the truncated data in our database. The original is always in our database. We do not store the truncated version of it anywhere except in the mapping to go out to the, the data aggregators and our, and our web portal. So we're not storing two sets of data. We always have the original data in our database. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Uh, James Macklin says, I assume that you are also truncating the verbatim location data so that it cannot be georeferenced to a more specific locality. I believe many paleo sites are well known and easily discoverable. Perhaps this is a double standard. We don't, um, uh, the only part that we send out is we send out county level data, county and, and uh, state and country level data to the data aggregators and to our web portal. We don't send out in um, any of the uh, more exact locality data. And as, as James said, uh, perhaps this is a double standard, but it's easily discoverable. Yes, there is a lot of, of the paleo sites that are out there that are, um, that are already published or well-known. 
uh, we've just made the choice that we are not going to to publish those on our website. Not saying that we will not give those to people, but um, we we decided not to do that. And I will say we there was a conference last week that discussed this a little bit, and one of the things maybe Deb Paul mentioned, I think it was, was trying to hide sites and coordinates is really difficult because you have one thing and you're like, I don't want to share this and you obscure that data. Well, you found 800 other specimens at the same site and you didn't obscure that data. So it's really easy to get the information. So trying to figure out how to preserve it so people can't find it is extremely difficult and complicated. And I don't think anybody has come up with a great solution or a perfect solution yet. But this is one thing Leslie's been able to figure out. Does anybody have any other questions? Are there any questions for any of our earlier presenters? Feel free to type those in. I will undismiss some of these so we can reopen questions. Let's pick a dude. I don't know who some of these are for, so some of these I can't right. direct. But um, Mayor, I know, wanted to ask Rich, at RSA, we have several thousand georeferences that were done outside of our database and are now faced with the challenge of repatriating that data and importing into our specified database. Have you been able to import slash repatriate georeferences into your specified database from Symbiota data? I would say a combination of yes and no. It's sort of a wishy-washy answer. If something we're intending to do with some of our existing data that's still out in Symbiota that has not been reincorporated, uh, we did do that when we imported uh, one of the large data sets earlier. We brought in data from Symbiota and I believe we can still, we're going to work on a way to get the rest of it in. So that's why the, Ambig slightly ambiguous answer. It's one of those things that's going to be possible, but not as straightforward as one might think. Thank you, Rich. Yep. Uh, I don't know who some of these are from. Maybe you guys could all contribute to, oh, somebody specifically said Talia, so I'll ask that one. Talia, uh, Melissa Frey wants to know, have you used R for any other data cleanup slash semi-automated processes other than the image data? Or do you have plans to? If so, can you discuss examples of how it can be used? Um, for right now, we've only used it for the image attachments. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> Um, but I will say we um, just, can I actually answer part of the question that Rich was, the georeferencing question that was directed at him? Um, Please do. Uh, so we have also tried to do, so we're part of another TCN, the Cretaceous Worlds TCN that was very georeference focused. Um, and we ended up doing a lot of our georeferences outside of specify in Excel um, for a variety of reasons. Um, primarily being that we didn't have the form set up and specify um, when the project started to accept all the georeference data. Um, so we had a lot of georeferencing happening outside of specify. Um, and we've actually gone back to that workflow now that we're working remotely um, because connecting to specify um, on the VPN is uh, difficult for a lot of our students that are working from home. So we, um, contracted with a programmer who was familiar with SQL to um, import some of that data back into specify for us. 
And there are definitely some pitfalls if anybody wants to talk about that, that we had, and I had to um, come crawling back to um, the developers that specify to fix some things that we broke. Um, so just be careful with some of those things and be aware there, there are some pitfalls um, with the relationships that are a little, they're easy to break and easy to duplicate um, and you might break some things, but um, it is doable, I think, if you, if you know what you're doing. Thanks, Talia. So uh, we are at our nine o'clock and thank you so much, everyone. We have right now 310 participants. Thank you so much for tuning in today and a huge shout out and thank you to our six presenters.